free financial modeling tutorial video on YouTube. Now, this time around, we're going to be talking about merger models, also known as accretion dilution models. And specifically, we're going to be looking at a model here for this deal between United Technologies and Goodrich Corporation, which was around a $16 billion deal in the aerospace and defense industry. And we're going to be using the outline of this model to teach a very important rule, which is how to use a rule of thumb to tell whether a merger or acquisition is going to be accretive or dilutive. Now, the concept, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because I'm assuming you already know something about this, but an M&A deal is accretive if the combined company's earnings per share is higher than the buyer's standalone earnings per share before the transaction. It's dilutive if the combined EPS is lower, and it's neutral if the EPS is the same afterward. So in this deal, for example, let's scroll down to the combined income statements for the companies. And you can see right here, let's just group this so you can see this a little bit better. So you can see it right here. We have our combined EPS at the top, and then we have the buyer's standalone EPS. So United's EPS for these two years before the transaction took place. So these are projections as if the acquisition never happened. And you can see in this case that the combined EPS is higher than the standalone EPS, and therefore it's an accretive deal by about 1.9% then by about 3.1% in year two. So that's what we want to be able to tell in advance, whether or not this combined EPS figure is going to be higher or lower than the standalone figure. Now this is very important for a couple of reasons. One is that it's much easier to actually do these deals in the first place if a deal is accretive. If it's dilutive, it's going to be much harder to convince your board of directors at the company to actually go along with it because they care a lot about earnings per share. Investors care a lot about it. They are not going to do good things to your stock price if after you acquire a company, the combined earnings per share falls by a significant amount or even by a small amount in some cases. Now, in addition to figuring this out in real life and actually making deals happen, it's also important because as I say over here, it is a very, very common interview question. They could always ask you, how can you tell in advance if a deal is accretive or dilutive just knowing the purchase price, the method of payment, and something about the interest rates, the cost of issuing stock, the PE multiples of the buyer and seller. And a lot of people think there's no way to tell. They think you actually have to go through the whole model, which is incorrect. To really get it precise, yes, you have to go through the whole model, but you can come up with a rough approximation just knowing some basic information in advance. And then finally, of course, it's very useful in real life because you can always use this to sanity check your model and approximate the impact of the deal in advance. So if, for example, you run the numbers and yours come out to be far different from the actual model's numbers, then you know that something is wrong and you may need to recheck your work. So here is the rule of thumb. What you have to do is calculate the weighted cost of acquisition for the buyer, and then you compare it to the seller's yield at its purchase price. And if the seller's yield is more than what the buyer is paying for it, more than this weighted cost, it's accretive. Otherwise, if the yield is lower than the weighted cost of acquisition, then it is dilutive. So you can think of it like this. Let's go up to the top and show you some numbers here. So in this case, the weighted cost of the acquisition for the buyer is 3.8%, and the yield of the seller at the purchase price is 5.6%. So in this case, the buyer is paying 3.8%, but they're getting something that is yielding 5.6%. So common sense tells you it's a good deal for the buyer. It's probably going to be an accretive deal. So that's how that works. And if we were to change the numbers here, so let's say we make the numbers here significantly different. Well, in this case, take a look at this. Our weighted cost is 7.9% now, and the yield of the seller is only 5.6% still. So now it flips to a dilutive deal because our debt interest rate here went up. So that is the basic idea. Now the yield of the seller, this is pretty intuitive because all you're doing here is you are taking the seller's net income and dividing by the equity purchase price that the buyer is paying for them. So buyer seller N27, that's just their net income linked to from another worksheet. And then the equity purchase price here, well, this one, if you go up, it's simply what I have out here. So this 15.9 billion, 16 billion number. So you're essentially saying, okay, they pay 15 or 16 billion. And then after taxes, how much in after-tax profits does the seller actually generate given that the given the amount that they're paying for them. And in this case, the yield is about 5.6%. So this part is pretty intuitive. It's just what in after-tax profits the seller is actually going to generate. The part that's a little more confusing is the weighted cost of acquisition for the buyer. So let's take a look at this formula and then break it down. So this formula is really taking the percent cash 
times the cost of cash. That's the first part. And then what we want to do is take the percent stock used plus the cost of issuing stock. And then we want to add that to the percent debt used times the cost of issuing debt. So you probably understand what the weighted part of this now means because really all we're doing is taking the percent of each purchase method and then multiplying by the cost of that purchase method. But how do we actually calculate the cost of each of these things? What does that even mean? Well, let's go into these formulas and look at it in more detail and I'll show you exactly how you get to these numbers. What is the cost of cash? Well, when a buyer uses cash to acquire a seller, what is it really paying? It's not exactly paying an additional expense, but what it is doing is giving up interest on that cash in the future. So we call that foregone interest on cash. And you see the foregone cash interest rate right here. So by paying whatever they're paying in cash for the seller, the buyer can now no longer earn interest on that cash in the future. And since we are looking at the net income numbers, that interest after taxes has already been factored into the buyer's projections, meaning that afterward, the buyer's numbers are going to fall. Their net income is going to fall because they no longer have that cash and they're no longer earning interest income on whatever they've spent. And you can see the cost right here. It's just the interest rate times one minus the buyer's tax rate. So that's pretty standard. And I think this part is pretty intuitive. We're just taking the interest rate and we do have to pay taxes on interest income. So we multiply by one minus the tax rate to see what we get after taxes there. And similarly, the debt is also pretty straightforward. If we have additional interest expense on debt, well, just like interest income, interest on debt is also also affects your taxes. In this case, it is tax deductible, so it reduces the amount of taxes you have to pay when you pay interest on debt. And you can see over here, it's just the equal to the interest rate times one minus the buyer's tax rate once again. So I think both of those are pretty intuitive if you sit back and think about them. You're simply looking at the difference in interest that you pay after the acquisition, multiplying by one minus the tax rate of the buyer, as always in an deal, because the buyer's tax rate is what the combined tax rate for the company will be in the future. And you're multiplying by that to get the after tax impact of these things. Now the cost of issuing stock, this one is actually a very simple formula. All we're doing is flipping the buyer's PE multiple here. So we're taking United's PE multiple of 11.3x, which is what it was just before the deal was announced or just before it closed. We're flipping it around. What does this actually mean? Well, if you think about the definition of PE multiple, I'm going to scroll over here to the side to explain this a little bit more. You can see I have some notes here. These will also be made available right below this video for you. So you can think about it like this. The after-tax cost of issuing stock, one divided by the buyer's PE multiple. So basically taking the reciprocal of that. It's effectively the after-tax yield of the buyer. So for example, if you bought one share of the buyer's stock, that is the net income you'd be entitled to with that one share. So in this case, one over the buyer's PE multiple is 8.9%, meaning that if you buy $1 worth of United stock, you get 8.9 cents in net income from that. And that's really all it means. So if you think about what's going on here, really all we're doing is comparing what we get from buying the seller after tax yield. So that's the after tax yield for the seller. And then we look at the buyer's intrinsic after tax yield, at least for the stock component of this deal. And that is what the cost of issuing stock right here is. Now, you could think about this in many other ways. For example, you also know that PE equals price per share divided by earnings per share. And you know that PE equals market cap divided by net income. So if you flip it and you say 1 over PE, that equals net income over market cap, which is, again, the same thing. It's effectively the after-tax yield of the buyer, which you're comparing directly to the seller and seeing if this is higher or lower, except you can't just factor this in. You also have to factor in the cost of cash and debt. So that is how you can think about it. And you can go through this yourself and you can try this out with any deal that you look at and you can use this as a rough approximation sometimes it's a little bit difficult to find the interest rates on these things but you can always look in a company's filings to approximate them and you can see here that as we change this around this deal and the status of this is going to change as well so for example let's say i increase the buyer's pe multiple greatly so let's say i make this 25x well you can see the impact if the buyer has a higher pe multiple now well 
generally, it's going to be much easier for the deal to be accretive because the buyer's stock is more valuable, meaning that the buyer will not have to issue as much stock, meaning that its earnings per share will not fall by as much because of that additional outstanding stock. They have less in the way of outstanding stock. Their EPS will therefore not fall by as much. Whereas if I decrease the PE multiple, well, let's take a look at this. Now you can see it actually flips and it's now a dilutive deal because the buyer's stock is worth a lot less. They have to issue a whole lot more stock to acquire the seller. And similar logic applies to these. It's more intuitive a little bit though, because you would think that if you pay more in interest to acquire the seller, then it's going to be more dilutive, less accretive. And of course, that's what happens. Let's say I change the debt interest rate to 15%. Well, Again, it flips the dilutive because now we have a much costlier acquisition here. So that is a bit of a rule of thumb and a trick you can use to estimate this in advance. Now I have a bunch of other notes here in the Excel file. These notes will be printed below the video because I realize you may not be able to access this Excel file. So these will be printed below the video. You can take a look at them yourself. There are some limitations to this. If the tax rates between the buyer and seller are different, it won't hold up 100%. Also, we're not factoring write-ups, write-downs, synergies, cumulative impacts, additional costs. If we have a timing difference, it's not going to hold up there. But when all is said and done, this is a very handy rule to use and to know for interview questions. So just to recap, it is a very common question in interviews to be asked, how can you tell if an M&A deal is going to be accretive or dilutive? There are shortcuts to doing this. We just went over one of them here. It's accretive if the combined EPS is higher than the buyer's standalone EPS. It's, it's dilutive if the combined EPS is lower. And the way you calculate this is you look at the weighted cost of acquisition for the buyer, compare it to the seller's yield. In other words, the seller's net income divided by the equity purchase price paid for the seller. If the seller's yield is higher, it's accretive. Otherwise, if it's lower, it's dilutive. If they're the same, it's neutral. And you calculate the weighted cost by taking the after-tax cost of cash and debt which is the interest rate times one minus the tax rate for both of them, and then the after-tax cost of issuing stock, which is the reciprocal of the PE multiple, and you multiply each of those by the percent cash, debt, and stock used, and that is how you can estimate this one in advance. So hopefully you learned something useful that you can put to use in interviews and also on the job when you're going through this type of exercise just to check your own work. Very handy, as I said, it doesn't hold up 100%, but very, very good time-saving rule that you can use to check your work and also to answer a lot of questions in interviews and case studies.